Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Braden Knusen. I'll be your host for this webinar today. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us and invite you to participate in some of the polls that we have on the screen as we get going through our announcements and our introduction here. Our next webinar that we will have this month is a Family Search Family Tree question and answer session with Catherine Grant. And so if you have any questions about, you know, how to use Family Search Family Tree or, you know, any specific you know, things that are always confusing. Um, let us know. Submit those questions ahead of time. Um, there is a link on this month's schedule to a survey where you can submit those questions and we will get those all organized so we can answer them next week in our webinar. Um, also, just another um, reminder, if you are having trouble watching our YouTube videos in your ward um, church building or your local family history center, we have a, a um, a new viewing platform to allow you to watch those videos at those buildings so that they're not blocked. Um, you can watch some of our previous webinars to see some um, live screen sharing of how to get to those spots. Um, it's just in the introduction, the first couple of minutes or so, so you can go back and watch those and you'll be able to see how to find those videos and um, use those. And it's always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu. Um, we love feedback, and we are trying to make these webinars as useful as possible and um, as easy to understand as we can. So please let us know how we can change or make things a little bit better. So today we'll be pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation titled, Using the Source Linker in Family Search Family Tree. After years on the sidelines, Catherine started doing family history and discovered a new passion. Her specialty is mentoring new family historians and helping them find success, and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. Catherine works for the LDS Church as a technical writer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and homemade guacamole. And as we turn the time over to Catherine, just remind everybody about our comments and questions box on the right-hand side of the screen. Any comments or questions that you guys submit, we'll make sure that those questions get answered by the end of the presentation. And Catherine, whenever you're ready, feel free to take it away. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Brayden. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We're so grateful to have you with us. As Brayden mentioned, our topic today is the Family Tree Source Linker. This is one of the best tools, I think, in Family Search Family Tree. And so I'm excited to have this chance to explore it a little more. So let's take a look at what we'll be covering today, our, our little schedule. First of all, we will, just to make sure we're on the same page, we will talk about what exactly the source linker is and look at a little detail on that. Then we're going to look at two basic examples. One example that has just one person on the record that we're trying to attach, and another example that has multiple people on the record that we're trying to attach. Then after we look at those examples, we're going to look at a few of the extra features that come along with the source linker showing and hiding information, changing the focus person, aligning names. So in other words, if the person name and the source name aren't lined up correctly, there's a way to fix that. And then also, we'll be talking about the add feature. So let's go ahead and dive in. What exactly is the source linker? Well, in a nutshell, the source linker is the tool that's used to attach sources from Family Search historical records to a person page in Family Tree. It's important to make that distinction. We can get sources from many different places, from Ancestry.com, from Find a Grave, MyHeritage, a number of places. But the only place that the source linker uses is Family Search historical records. And so there's a little um, image here that shows you what the source linker looks like. But let's take a little, a little uh, more detailed look at that. What exactly are we seeing when we look at the source linker? Well, basically, we're looking at information from the record on the left-hand side, from the historical record that we're considering attaching. 
And then on the right hand side, we're seeing the information from Family Tree that we're considering attaching the source to. So basically, it lines them up side by side so that we can see if we really do want to attach that source. How do we get to the source linker? Well, basically, it comes up automatically whenever you attach a source, or excuse me, at, it attach a family search historical record from one of three places. It comes up when you click a record hint on the person page. It also comes up when you do a logo search from the person page. And we will show examples of both of these. And then also, it shows up when you find a record directly in Family Search Historical Records and attach it from there. So let's look at our basic examples of attaching a source. The first example is just going to attach a source for one person on the record. So we're looking at the Family Tree Person page of Hannah Holtby. Hannah died as a child in 1861. And so because of the time period and the place where she's living, England, I know that there should be a civil registration of her death. And so I am going to look in, I'm going to do a logo search to see if, and that's actually not a formal name, that's just the name I like to give it. It means that you're searching using one of these logos in the search record box. So I am going to click Family Search to run a search to see if I can find the civil registration of death for this sweet Hannah. Notice that when I click the logo search, the search is actually run in a new tab. So Hannah's page, her person page, is still open over here, but the search results have showed up in this second tab. And lo and behold, the death's registration comes up as one of the first results. I, I didn't rig that, it just happens that that was the very first search result of this search. And so I go ahead and click the little view icon over here to see more detail about the source. Before I do that, I did want to point out that if you see this little logo um, icon here, that means that this particular source is already attached to some family tree record. But we see that there's no uh, little pedigree logo here, so that means that this record, this death registration, has not yet been attached to anybody. So I want to attach it to this Hannah, so I go ahead and click the little document icon here. What that does is bring up a page with a little more detail. It lets me do a quick sanity check to see if I really do want to attach this person to Hannah Holtby and Family Tree. Well, as I look at it, it looks good. It looks like what I'm expecting. It's a good match. It's the right time, um, you know, right uh, quarter of the year. It's the right year. And it's the right registration district and, of course, the right name. So I am going to click Attach to Family Tree. And that takes me into the source linker. So the, what you'll notice is that, you remember we said the information from the record is on the left-hand side and the information from Family Tree is on the right-hand side. Well, now I want to compare that information just as a final double check and make sure that I really do want to attach this source. So suppose that you do what I sometimes do. We did that quick sanity check right on the front, but what if I forgot, oh, what quarter of the year was it? Or um, was there something, some other red information, like what was the page or the volume? If I've forgotten that, then family or the source linker, the family tree source linker, gives me a chance to look at the basic information right from the source linker screen. So when I click record, I get a pop-up that shows me, again, that information that I, that I already looked at. But, you know, you might think, oh, I never need that. But I'm surprised at how often <laughs> I do want to look at this again just one more time. So that's how you do it. And then if you are, when you are ready to close the record, you just click this X in the upper right-hand corner. So clicking that X brings us back to the main source linker page. And I did want to comment on two other things before we go ahead and attach this source. One is that 
the you are uh, the source linker allows you to tag a record and so right here it kind of assumes what I'm going to want to tag this record for it assumes that I want it for evidence of the name which I do and also for death information now you might remember where the tagged information shows up it shows up on the person page when you click something in the vital information section. So for instance, if I were to click the name in the vital information section, then this death record, which uh, when I attach it, this de death record would show up under the name as a link, as um, being a tagged source that applies to the name. And same thing for the death. If I were to click on the death information in the vital information on the person page, this source would show up as a link under death. Now you do also have the option to add the source to the source box. I normally don't do that with a family search historical record source because it I, I used to all the time and it just never ended up being something that I used because the source is attached to the person and so there wasn't really a reason to keep it in the source box. I do keep other sources like from you know newspapers and such or um, things that I've added and uploaded. I might keep them in my source box because they're not family search historical records but the historical records are so easily available either from historical records or attached to the person that I just haven't found it necessary. But if in your system you do like to put it in the source box, just click that uh, checkbox right there and it will be added to the source box. The next thing that we do is add a reason statement. Reason statements are really, really important because they help people know why you attach this source. In other words, what value does it provide? It's, uh, reason statements are also a pain, honestly. A lot of people find them difficult to write. Uh, they just don't, they wonder, what on earth am I going to say about this? So you'll be happy to know that we actually have a webinar about family tree reason statements. So we're not going to go into a lot of detail about those today, but if you are interested, go to the BYU Family History Library webinar page and look for the webinar called Family Tree Reason Statements Made Easy. So the next thing that we do after putting a reason statement in is that we click the attach button. And that actually attaches this historical record or a link to it to this person on their person page. Notice that the background turns green and that indicates that the source has been successfully attached. And then also remember that it used to say compare here, but now that we've completed our comparison and the record is attached, there's no need to compare. But what if we accidentally attach the person, the record to the wrong person? Then we would need to detach it, and that's what this icon does. We won't walk through that because it's so straightforward, but you just click detach to remove this record if you accidentally attached it to the wrong person. So now that we're done with attaching this source to the person, we want to close this, this tab for the source linker because we're done with it. But then something interesting happens. We go back to Hannah's person page and the source does not show up. Why would that be? Well, for some reason, the page has to be refreshed. Uh, Family Search could refresh it automatically, but they've chosen not to. And there's probably some good reasons for that. They want to give the user control. So you do need to refresh the person page in order for that source to show up. After refresh, oh, and if one of some of you are wondering what does refresh mean, normally on most browsers there's a refresh button up by the address bar, and it usually looks like a little circle with an arrow on it. Uh, I know in Chrome and in Firefox that's the case. In some other browsers it may be different, but just look for the refresh function. Um, if, if you don't see it easily, I would Google it for your particular browser. And the other thing to be aware of is that if you're a keyboard person, Control F5 
will refresh the page as well. So either look for the refresh icon or do a control F5 and then go back to the sources section and the uh, source that we just added will show up. By default, the source that we just added will show up at the top of the list. But what if I don't want it at the top? What if I want my sources in chronological order from birth to death? Well, there's two easy ways to reorder the sources. One is that you can actually click and drag that source and drop it to a new location. So you notice this gray bar uh, appears when I actually clicked and dragged this source down. So wherever that gray bar appears is where I'm going to drop that source. The other thing is that these old arrows, these were actually the old way of moving sources. And you would click the arrow to move it down row by row. So if on, on occasion I found that the dragging doesn't work for some reason, it's not very often that that happens, but once in a while. So if you drag and it doesn't work, then hover over the source and you're going to see these arrows off to the right hand side. Just click the arrow until it gets the source to the position where you want it. And here we have our source in the right place where I wanted it at the end of the list because it's chronologically the last thing that um, happened to this person. She passed away. So that is our first example with just one person on a record. Let's go ahead and look at a second example of multiple people on a record. So this one we're going to attach from a record hint. So I click the box here, the, or the link here, that uh, is the source that I want to attach. And when I do, I get something very similar to that um, kind of sanity check screen that we saw in historical records, except here it's a flyout. So you can see that the little arrow is pointing here to the source that we clicked, and it just flies out right on the screen. So I do a quick sanity check and everything looks good and so I want to click review and attach. And it takes me right back to the source linker. But you notice there's something a little bit different about what happened when I attached from a record hint as opposed to from a logo search. What happened, what's different about it, is that this is expanded automatically. The, the record was, uh, they call it the principal, the principal person on the record was Isabella because it was her christening, but there's also information about her parents. But because I clicked from the record hint, it opens Isabella up automatically and saves me the trouble of clicking compare for her. So basically from here the procedure is very similar. You just put in the reason statement and then you click attach and it turns green. But notice that you've still got the parents that you can compare and attach. Now sometimes people say why on earth do I want to attach this source about Isabella to the parents because the source is really about her. And that is true. The source is primarily about her but there's a, a, an advantage of attaching the parents because it is evidence of their relationship to their daughter. So I usually will go ahead, actually I always will go ahead and attach them just because I think it's valuable to prove that relationship. So we go ahead and click compare. Of, uh, for Charles and you notice that now it expands him. But notice it remembered the reason statement that I had put in for Isabella. Now normally that's really a good thing, particularly on a census record. The, the reason for attaching everybody in a family of a census record is usually the same. So then it saves you the trouble of retyping that reason statement over and over. But in this case, the reason for attaching the source to Isabella was not the same as the reason for attaching the source to Charles. So in this case, fortunately, it's real. well, let me take two on that. I didn't say that right. It, fortunately, it's very easy to edit the source. So in this case, since we need to, we'll just go ahead and edit it. 
and we'll just use a standard reason statement here for um, this source provo proving or providing evidence for Charles' relationship as father to Isabella. So from this point on, everything is the same. We go ahead and click Attach, and then we would click Compare for Fanny, and we would uh, just adjust the, the reason statement to say Fanny's relationship as mother to Isabella, and then we would click Attach for Fanny, and then we would be done with attaching this record to all three people that it applies to. So those are our two basic examples, but let's go ahead and look at some of the cool additional features that are available in the Source Linker. You've probably noticed that um, sometimes the Source Linker page can be a little complicated. It depends on who's on the record and who's on the um, who's in the family and family tree. When there's a lot of people on both, then you end up with this big long record and it can be a little bit unwieldy to use on the screen. Well, fortunately, the source linker lets you show and hide different parts of the information on the screen. Here's an example of showing and hiding an entire section. So by default, this other on record section is open. But suppose that it's just getting in my way and I want to, to collapse it while I focus on some other things. Well, I go ahead and click close and you notice that it collapses this down to just one line instead of this large box. And if I want to see it again, I just click open again and it uh, expands it back to the way it initially was. So that's for a section, but suppose that I just wanted to show or hide details about a specific person. In that case, I would go ahead and click Details, and it expands it to show all the details about Alice. And then if I was ready to um, hide those details again, I would just click Close, and it would revert to this previous state where it's just the little line here instead of the larger box. Now let's talk about another feature that I think is so cool, but it's one that it's not used a lot because I think a lot of times people don't know about it. So what is the focus person to start out with? The focus person is the main person that we're dealing with on the source linker. You identify them because the box is a little bit wider. So in this particular example, John Thomas Holtby is my focus person. His parents are shown above him and his children or siblings, just depending on what's in family tree, are shown below. But then also, we've got these other people down here that um, don't appear to be part of his immediate family. So for example, this John Holtby, I happen to know from doing research that John is William's brother. So he's actually this guy's uncle. But uncles and grandparents and so forth don't show up in the source linker, only parents, children, spouses and siblings show up in the source linker, so basically the immediate family. But what if I want to attach this record to John, the uncle, because he's living with the family there and the source applies to him? Well, that's what changing focus does. What we do, you change focus by clicking this change uh, button, I guess you could call it, or change link over here on the right hand side. When I click Change, it gives me a drop-down with the immediate family, and it includes, on this one, it includes the grandparents of William, or excuse me, the parents of William, because I clicked Change from him. And actually, I just realized on the previous screen that was wrong. I apologize. I showed clicking the change next to John, and that's not what we wanted to do. We wanted to click change next to William so that we could navigate to his brother. So we click change next to William, and we see William's parents, William's spouse, William's children. And we want to go ahead and click 
Thomas Holt be the dad. And when we do that, we are able to see the children of William, which also shows us the brother. Uh, okay, did I say that right? Wait, I, it shows us the children of Thomas and Elizabeth, and so therefore it shows us the brother of William. So I go ahead and click on John, who is the person that I want to attach that source to. And SourceLinker, fortunately, was smart enough to move John up. You remember, he was down here at the bottom. So SourceLinker was smart enough to move him up to the top. And now I can just click Compare and attach him as I would any other source. But what if SourceLinker doesn't move John up to the top? There have been occasions where that's happened, where I've um, changed the focus over here on the side, but the person at the bottom doesn't automatically move. Well, then you use change over on the left-hand side. And when you click that, it shows all the people on the record, and you just select the person that you want to move next to the person that you changed focus on this side of the screen. OK, so now we will talk about adding a feature. All my examples today are actually going to be cautions because it's very, very rare that it's actually appropriate to use the add feature function. Most of the time, in my experience, it will result in adding something that is not quite correct. So I wanted to show you examples of why that would be. So in this particular record, we've got Harry. Um, born in 1872, and it looks like he needs to be added as another child of Wesley and Elizabeth. But I did some research on that, and some of you might have seen that in a previous webinar that we did. Harry actually does not exist. He was a, an enumerator mistake. There's no birth record for him. He doesn't show up in any other census. I'm guessing that either the enumerator heard it wrong or the person that copied the original enumerator's records thought the two R's were two T or the two T's were two R's or something. But careful research showed that this family only had a daughter named Hattie. They did not have a son named Harry. So if I were to add Harry, I would be doing temple work for somebody that didn't need it, that didn't even exist. Now that brings up another point, though. So we'll interrupt our little um, look at the, at the problems with adding names to talk about how to align names when they're not, added, not lined up. So this source really does apply to Hattie, even though the first name is incorrect. So the way that I can get it lined up so that I can attach the source rather than adding an incorrect person is that you actually just click and drag it. So when I click and drag Harry, these little arrows show up. And the, the person that he, the source is going to be attached to turns yellow. So I just drag it until the person turns yellow, which in this case is Hattie, and then I let it go. And from then, it, you can attach it. Now you might be asking, why on earth would I want to attach the source if it's the wrong name? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Because the source is really correct, it really applies to Hattie, it's just the wrong name. So that's why a good reason statement is so important. I would explain in the reason statement that I'd done my due diligence and determined that there was no Harry, there was no birth record for him, he never shows up anyplace else, etc., etc., and that therefore it, this appears to be an enumerator mistake and the source really applies. And then another reason to attach it is that if you don't, then this is going to keep showing up as a person that needs to be added, and somebody else who maybe hadn't done the research and wasn't aware might, with very good intentions, go ahead and add Harry as a person who needs temple work, and that would not have been correct. Oh, and I should say, another time that that's helpful is sometimes in maybe in your family this happens, I know it happens a lot in mine, that people will be born with one name, but later on they'll go by a different name. So for instance, just the other day there was a woman whose full name was Anne Charlotte, 
She was Anne in some early records, and then she started going by Charlotte later on. Well, Source Linker didn't always match up the Anne's and the Charlotte's because they looked like, in some cases, they were two different people. So that's another case where you can drag a source that's not showing up next to the correct person to show up next to the correct person. So here is another situation where the add feature would uh, end up adding people incorrectly to family tree. So we look at this particular source linker and we say, oh wow, it looks like there's three kids to add. But let's take a closer look. First of all, the names are different than the head of household. Could this head of household be a, a could he have adopted kids with this last name? Of course he could. But normally that doesn't happen, and so it is a bit of a red flag. It's something that we'd want to check into. Then we've got something else a little strange down here. We've got an Isabella Ward, so her name is the same, but she's listed as a mother-in-law. But when we look at the dates, we see that Isabella, born in 1842, cannot possibly be the mother-in-law to the head of household born in 1816. So the enumerators were told that they were supposed to state relationships always to the head of household, but they didn't always. Well, some further research actually revealed that these kids are children of Isabella. In, in England, sometimes in-law was used as a synonym for step. And so to say that someone was an in-law sometimes meant they were a step whatever. Like you'll notice once in a while in a census, there will be somebody listed as a daughter-in-law when that person is very clearly a stepdaughter to the head of household. They might be like two years old or something, and they're very obviously not a daughter-in-law. And it's the same case here, where Isabella, the, the enumerator did two things, actually, that they shouldn't have done, according to the instructions. They, first of all, called her, or excuse me, they, they indicated her relationship to these kids, and they indicated these kids' relationships to um, her instead of to the, to the head of household. So what we're looking at here is that Isabella is actually, we know from research, this William's daughter. So he's not, she's not the mother-in-law, she's the daughter, but then also the enumerator stated her relationship to these children rather than the head of household, and she's not even really their direct mother. She is their stepmother because she married a widow who already had kids. Uh, the third one appears possibly to be from her marriage to to this Mr. Ward, but that I still haven't proven yet, and I've got to, to still figure that out. But the first two children for sure were not her children. They were her, quote, stepchildren. So if I had added these people here, if I'd added them as William's kids, that would have been incorrect. But even if I had changed focus and I had added them as Isabella's kids, that would have also been incorrect because they were biological kids of her, or her, of her husband and his first wife. You might say, well, that those are probably exceptions. But to be honest with you, I found out that they're... It, it will more often be incorrect to add somebody from the source linker than it will be correct. Another time when it's also not correct to add somebody is in the case of a census where the woman is going by her married name. So if Mary had showed up over here, she actually doesn't on the census, but if Mary had showed up in this census as Mary Greener, then adding her to family tree as Mary Greener 
would not be correct because the rule in family tree is that women are added under their birth name because that enables us to search for duplicates. So if I added her as Mary Greener and searched for a duplicate, her birth information, any birth duplicates would not come up. So not only would I have added her with an incorrect surname because again she's supposed to use her birth name in family tree and also all genealogy sites, but then also I would have um, not been able to locate her birth records and there's a very high likelihood that I would have added a duplicate. So what do I recommend on that? Only use the add feature if you've already verified the people to be added. There are occasions when I've done that and so it's a nice convenience to be able to just click add and add them to the right person but I only do that if I'm absolutely certain that number one the name is completely correct and the date is also correct and also that the relationships that will be added are also correct. So this brings us to the end of our webinar today on the Source Linker. So just as a summary, we reviewed exactly what the Source Linker is. We looked at a couple of basic examples. And then we also looked at the cool additional features of showing and hiding information, changing the focus person so you can attach the source. And again, that's mainly useful if someone in the extended family shows up on the record. Then we also talked about how to align names and cautions for the add feature. So thank you everybody for attending this webinar today. And Braden, do we have any questions? Um, yes, there is a question. Um, someone asked if there is an autofill program like the one you use in Chrome when adding reason statements for Safari. Oh, there. I actually don't remember if Safa if this particular one uses Safari. So um, the name of the extension that I use, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is Simple Fill. So if you Google Simple Fill, but don't just Google Simple Fill by itself because then hilariously you get like a bunch of um, prescription, medicine prescription sites. So do something like Simple Fill Browser Extension. And if you do that, you'll find the Simple Fill page. And I apologize that I don't remember if it works on Safari, but that page will tell you. And I know for sure that it does work in Chrome and in Firefox. Thank you for that great question. All right, I think for now that is all the questions that we have. Catherine, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And if anybody else does have a question, please feel free to enter those into the questions box on the screen. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today and hope that you'll be able to come back and participate in our question and answer session that we have going on next week. Remember to submit your questions via the link on the February webinar schedule. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see when we upload new videos. You can come back and rewatch the webinars that you watch live. A lot of times it helps so you can pause it, get some information, keep moving on. Um, and then you can also share those with your friends and family, which is always an, a wonderful thing. Um, please make sure to leave some feedback for us at the before you leave today. We appreciate your feedback and always are trying to improve these webinars. Um, Tell us what you think, what we can do to improve any part or what you like. Um, that's always great as well. Again, thank you very much for joining us today, and we hope to see you next time.